Hello everyone, this is John Buck back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and in this video I'm going to show an example of solving for the Fourier transform of a rectangular pulse. I also wanted to, uh, uh, so this video assumes you've, you've watched the video already that talks about the basic Fourier transform equations and how they fit in the overall story of linear systems. Uh, and I wanted to show you briefly a picture. This is a picture, uh, an engraved portrait from the early uh, uh, 19th century, I think, of, of uh, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier, the, uh, the uh, inventor of the Fourier series and the Fourier transform, uh, as, as uh, was done uh, by a French engraver in his lifetime. So just to give you a sense of, of what Fourier looks like, I think this is one of the best portraits of him we had. I didn't make the portrait, just to give credit where credit is due, I found this on the Wikimedia, Wiki, yeah, Wikimedia webpage as a public domain image of Fourier. Okay, well let's, let's uh, move aside from Fourier and move on to our example for today. I should be more accurate, We're moving on from Fourier's portrait, and let's stick with his mathematics here. So in this video, we're going to say, imagine I have a, a, a rectangular pulse that goes from, uh, let's say, minus T1 to plus T1 with amplitude 1, so it's symmetric around the origin. This is my X of T, and what I want to do in this problem is find X of J omega. Okay, so our first step is, is just to start from the Fourier transform equation, that is the Fourier analysis equation. Right, so this is the equation we use when we have the time signal and we want to find X of J omega. And thinking about doing this integral, this infinite integral here, we're immediately going to see we can break this integral into three parts. Right? So we learned in calculus I could take any integral and break it into the sum of integrals as long as all the limits line up continuously to cover the same region. So pause the video for a moment and think about why might I have broken it up this way? What is it about writing this one integral into three integrals? It seems like more work. Why does this actually make it simpler? So pause the video and think about that for a second. All right, now that you're back, you know, why, why this is easier is that in this region from minus infinity to minus t1, that's this section of the graph here, x of t is 0. And if x of t is 0, then that term in the integral is 0. Similarly, from t1 going on this region of the graph, from t1 to infinity in the last integral, x of t is 0 and the integral will be 0. So we've immediately simplified it to recognize we just have one section in the middle, and in this region, this x of t is a nice constant 1. So we can now simplify this integral just to be the, the middle term. So, so the Fourier transform of this rectangular pulse is the integral from minus t1 to plus t1 of e to the minus j omega t dt. So looking at that, that's an exponential, a definite integral of an exponential with a little chain rule action involved because I've got that minus j omega up in the exponent as well. But I can do that pretty quickly, or it's also from the, the uh, sheet of essential math equations in the class, right? So I end up with this uh, indefinite integral, and then let me put the, the limits we're going to evaluate it from t1 to minus t1 here. So let me now plug those in next. All right, so now I get something like this. I'll use these minus signs and reorganize the terms a little bit, and let's see what I get next. And I can also pull the j omega out front, so let's see what I get when I simplify like that. Right now when I look at this, right, I'm, well, this, this second term became the mi two minuses made it plus, and the positive exponent is first. This second this first term with the minus j omega t1 in the exponent is second. I pulled the j omega out front, and this thing in the square brackets looks very familiar from, from one of our Euler's equations. Right, this is 2j times sine of omega t1, so I can plug that in and simplify a little more. So I have 2 times j times the sine of omega t1 over j omega is my function of omega, and I can actually, I've got these j's that cancel out. And so I'm left with 2 times sine omega t1 over omega. Okay, so that's our equation for our Fourier transform. And then if we pause for a moment and step back, we say, well, you know what? I, I should have almost expected that because after all the things we did in discrete, we saw that when I had a rectangle in one domain, what did I get in the other? Some kind of sinc function, right? This is a kind of sine x over x type function. So this is is, you know, there's always a little thing you have to work out with the constants or whatever, but in terms of the type of function or the form of the function, this is sine x over x, but in the omega domain. So the rectangle in time gave me a sinc function and frequency. This is just kind of the other story 
other side of the story we saw in discrete when we had a ideal low pass filter with a, a rectangle and frequency and that gave me a sync function in the time domain for the impulse response. So although the story, the little details change about what's discrete, what's periodic, things like that when you go from, from discrete time linear systems to continuous time, the big picture is often the same that rectangles in one domain are some kind of sync function in the other and you, and you can sort of help that to figure out where you're going. The other thing that carries over from there is this original time signal we had was, a rect was symmetric around the origin and we ended up with a Fourier transform that's a real function. It could have been complex. I had a lot of J's flying around but when the dust settled they'd all canceled out and I was left with something that was real and that's another deep Fourier connection that says when I have uh, something that's uh, even symmetric and real in one domain is going to be even real and even symmetric in the other. And so about the symmetry thing, we have an equation here, but if you haven't worked with this equation a lot, it might not be obvious how does it behave, how does it depend on T1. So I'm going to extend this video, go on to a new page, and let's talk about how would we graph or sketch, not really graph, but let's, let's do a rough sketch of x of j omega to get a feeling for how it behaves. So if I start by looking at this equation, I say, well, the numerator, I have a sign of omega, right? Omega is my independent variable here, my frequency variable. I have a sign of omega, so that numerator is something that's oscillating, but the denominator is something that's just getting bigger and bigger. So I sort of expect I'm going to get something that roughly oscillates, but it's going to, as, as omega increases in either direction, it's going to get smaller and smaller. And so to make a reasonable sketch, we always want to know, well, what you know where, where is the thing largest where is it zero and if you know is it growing is it decaying is it how is it how is it behaving and so those are the things we're going to start to fill in here so another thing we answer another of the questions we might answer is well when is it going to be zero well this this will be zero when the numerator is zero and the denominator is not zero right if i have a zero in the numerator and a finite number in the denominator i will i will get zero overall so i want sine of omega t1 equal to zero, well that will happen every multiple of pi other than zero. Right? Actually, it, it will be zero every multiple of pi, but when, when omega is zero and the denominator is zero, that's a special case. I'll have zero over zero, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But for all the cases where, where uh, omega t1 equals a multiple of pi and m is not equal to zero, where it's not just zero, we will get the numerator to be zero. And so let's write that out. Right? And so now we could solve that for omega. So this is saying that every multiple of pi over t1, the numerator will be 0, and the whole thing will be 0. Uh, what else is, you know, and, and then we said, it, as we go, for, where is it going to have its maximum? Well, this sign is always going up and down between 0 and 1, 0 and 1, and 0 and 1. So it's sort of in a fixed range of amplitudes. We're going to, loosely speaking, we could do derivatives and all that, but we're just going to sort of be fast and loose here and say, well, as, as the denominator gets small, the numerator will get big. So let's think about what happens at omega equals zero. And there are two approaches, like many things in, in linear systems here. There's the, the sort of straightforward, grind it out way that will get you the answer, or you can be smart and lazy. Smart and lazy here means backing up to remember the original equation, right? And then say, what happens if I just substitute omega equals zero into both sides of this equation? When I do that, things get a lot simpler than anything I'm going to have to do with L'Hopital's rule in the sink function here. Because the right-hand side here becomes the integral of x of t e to the minus 0t. Well, this is just e to the 0, which e to the 0 is always 1. So this is a helpful shortcut that says when we want to find the value of the Fourier transform at 0, it will just be the area under the original time signal value integrated over all time. So or rather, integrating the function over all time is its total area. So coming back to the original signal, I can see it's one, it's a rectangle that's one tall, and it's from t1 to minus t1 wide, that's 2t1 wide. So the overall area is 1 times t1, or I'm sorry, 1 times 2t1, so 2t1. Oh, one page too far. So at 0, this will just have the Fourier transform at 0 is 2t1. So that will be the that'll turn out to be the maximum because as we go away from that, the sync function is oscillating, but the denominator that we're dividing by just keeps getting bigger and bigger, 
pulling it down and we'll have these zeros every pi over t. So let me try to sketch that now. So looking at the sketch we see that we have this peak at omega equals zero with height t1 and then as I move away from that the denominator is getting bigger pulling this thing down. I hit the first zero at pi over t1, right? We said every multiple of pi over t1 I get a zero. So then, oop, I labeled these wrong. Just a sec. Right, I, sorry, I had missed one there. So this one is 2 pi over t1, 3 pi over t1, 4 pi over t1. Each of those had hit zero. And each time in between, when the sine wave gets to sort of a maximum halfway between, it's getting pulled down smaller and smaller because that omega in the denominator, if I go back up here, this omega is getting bigger and bigger as I move further and further out the axis. So like the the, the sine function gets to a peak halfway between the two zeros, but that the further out I get, the more and more that omega on the edge is pulling it down. So I get this decaying sinc function that actually goes on forever. I've just drawn a bit of it here, but in general, these are the this is a, what a sinc function will look like. This sort of decaying thing here, or if you like, maybe it's kind of a bit of a an octopus that it doesn't really have enough tentacles, but you have a nice big head here and some wiggly arms going out. So you can use your imagination. But silliness about octopus aside, the other thing this points out is you can understand, we start to get some understanding of what's going on of how does this picture change as the rectangle gets wider or narrower. So imagine I made the rectangle twice as wide, like T1 got twice as big. Pause the video for a moment and think about what would happen, what would change. Right, well, if T1 gets twice as big, this pi over T1 is going to get half as small. So this intersection would move in. The sinc function would pull itself inward, but also get twice as tall. So let me try to quickly sketch that maybe in green. I'm going to be lazy and just draw the positive half for now, because the video is getting kind of long. But you can see it gets much taller, and then it oscillates much quicker. Right, and Instead of ha having a 0 every pi over T1, it's every pi over 2T. So the zero crossings are much closer together in omega. And that's a general theme. When things get wider in time, they get compacted in frequency. Because wider things are happening more gradually in time, which means they're lower frequency. So more of this, the recipe is getting moved to low frequencies. Vice versa, when things get smaller in time, like if T1 got half as wide, right? if, if, T, if I went from T1 to T1 over 2, things would get twice as, it would get shorter, but twice as wide here. So the red line shows what happens when I go to t1 over 2. So again, that basic intuition carries over from discrete time. Things that are small, compact, pulled in together in time are wide in frequency. Things that are wide in time and slowly evolving in time are pulled in together or, or at low frequencies. Okay, so this is long enough. I'm going to stop here. This is a, a good, simple, common function we'll use a lot. Uh, and I'll see you in the next video.